Good morning. It's absolutely fantastic to be with you this morning and I really uh, want to extend a, a very heartfelt thank you to Comcare for inviting me to be part of uh, this incredible community of practice. I think when you start a community and then you bring together really smart people that are in the room and are around the country, you have a really great opportunity to elevate and take forward uh, some really great thinking, some opportunities to change and improve and see really great outcomes. And I reflect on Superfriend as an organisation that I'm very fortunate to lead. And about 12 years ago, about 20 CEOs of the industry funds, which are these guys, uh, were sitting around the table thinking about what could they do in workplace mental health for their members. They represented well over half the working population, over 750,000 employers. And collectively, they were starting to see through their data some of the um, really devastating statistics around suicide and mental illness and came together and created Superfriend as an organisation. I've been fortunate to lead the organisation for coming up nine years and seen it from a little bitty organisation grow. And we ourselves have been on a, on a journey, as um, any organisation is, about how do we internally create a mentally healthy workplace for all of our people. I can tell you also as a first time CEO, I haven't got it right all the way through. I've learned a lot personally um, and I've had the absolute privilege of an incredible team to work with, um, work with us um, to help me in my learning journey. Today, I'll be sharing with you some of our fantastic insights from some of the research work that we've been doing on uh, indicators of a thriving workplace. And I think more importantly is at the back end of this presentation to talk with you and share with you some really simple, really practical, basic, but not easy basic, but basic things that we can be doing to really change the dialogue, shift the absolute behaviour change we need to see within organisations. Um, and so I'll start with talking with you about our indicators of a thriving workplace. Now, what this national research does is to measure against 40 scientifically validated indicators of a thriving workplace, where is Australia at? We do this on a national basis. There's over 5,000 respondents. It's representative of business owners, um, managers and people leaders, as well as workers across multiple industries. We have recently upped it from 38 indicators to 40 and done the work behind the scenes to validate those indicators. And I think that has brought a level of credibility to these national results. What we've done also over the 40 indicators is to break up the indicators uh, into five domains. And like many great frameworks or systems, these are integrated. Workplace mental health is complex. It's a complex construct. You cannot just take civility or risk management or any you know, leadership and just look at it in isolation. What we've heard this morning is such brilliant examples of how this has been brought to life through an integrated approach. And it's the same in the five domains that we've got here. Under each of those domains are four, uh, eight of the indicators. What we've also done, so 40 sounds a lot, I get that, but it takes about 20 minutes to do this survey. What we've also done is looked at, out of the 40 indicators, which of those indicators that are the top indicators, the most important to get right. And these are them. For leaders, it's about walking the talk when it comes to work life, mental health and wellbeing. This is about us as leaders role modelling to our people that we are walking the talk when it comes to workplace mental health. In connectedness, this is about their feeling like, and we've just heard this incredible word of community, that this is not just about getting the job done or the task done. This is a really great opportunity to build that sense of community across a workplace. In the policy perspective, it's great to have the policies, but they're absolutely useless unless they're in action and people see them in action. So what we've pulled out of this is about having that action plan and people actually seeing those policies in practice. In the capability area, it really comes down to people having good capability about having mental health and wellbeing conversations. So this quite often will start with training um, and building capability of your leaders to be able to lean in and step in, pick up those early warning signs and really reach out to people who might be struggling and needing some further support. 
And in the culture area, and we've heard this again this morning, it's really around that sense of purpose and meaning. Something bigger than just me that I can attach to, that I can create with the job that I'm doing today is actually bigger and broader. So I'm going to share with you some of the results. Now we've been uh, cutting and dicing over the, these 5,000 uh, plus respondents and looking at the results from numerous different ways. If you're interested, jump on the Superfriend website. We've got a range of different industry results in detail. We've looked at gender, a range of different ways. But I'm going to focus today on what does this mean for you in your jobs and your industries that you're representing. I would be suspecting the very vast majority of you have come into your career and why you are sitting in this chair today all over the country because you care and you want to make a difference. That will be a motivator because of why you're actually here. And so some of the results that I'm going to share with you are about the public um, administration and safety industry, which is a broad industry. Um, and I want you to have, to have a think about the results of this and what does it mean for you in the op opportunity that you have to influence change. The four, one in four people strongly agree with these results is the national average. I'll just explain on each of the following few slides. At the end of each of the statements, the percentage is the um, results for the public administration and safety industry results. Okay. So about 25% of Australians strongly agree, and there's obviously a, a cascade further down from that, that people are courteous and treat me with respect. People feel that they are part of a team. People would be happy to continue working in their workplace for as long as they can. There is a clear ex expectation that all leaders role model the values of the workplace, and that's obviously in the leadership domain. People feel committed to their work team. So at the end of these, you know, we've got 25% nationally, and we've got some results here um, of the public administration and safety industry results. About 20%, one in five people strongly agree that people are motivated to work hard because their job, uh, because their job is interesting and important to them personally. Interestingly, it's 13.4% strongly agree when we're looking at the public administration and safety results. For people who feel good about working here, it's at 14.9%. These are some sobering statistics, folks. Relationships are built on trust. 10% strongly agree. And yet we've heard how important trust is for civility, how important trust is to be able to have a conversation to say, what do I actually need? We've got people who care about each other. And I must say, when these stats came through from my amazingly smart people in my team and I looked at 8.9%, I did take a big deep breath in and thought, wow, these people who work in, in public administration and safety genuinely take roles because you care about people. And yet we've got, you know, within their own workplace, a, a statistic like this. So I think we've really got to have a think about our own backyard here as well as the good work that we're doing externally. We've got one in six people who strongly agree with people are comfortable voicing concerns about their job or things that might affect their job, and that's at 11.9%. There is support to help people practice good work, family life, whatever you want to call it, integration, balance, boundaries, whatever the terminology that you refer to, but it's about being able to be your whole self, bring your whole self to work, and make sure that you've got really great uh, balance within your world. And for the public administration and safety industry results, it's at 9.5%. One in eight people strongly agree. Efforts are made to help people find purpose and meaning. So if we reflect back around culture, which is the discussion for today, that is the single most important indicator out of the eight indicators for culture. And we've got 5.5%. The culture encourages open discussion about issues that affect mental health and wellbeing. We've got 6.6%. Trust me, the presentation gets better from here. <laughs> so I want to share with you where are, where are we at regarding Australia. Now, Australia is considered 
neck and neck with Canada as, as the best in the world when it comes to workplace mental health and wellbeing. And I think that's largely because we've had a really robust and great work health and safety approach in this country. We've dialed up psychological safety, particularly in the last few years. And I want to congratulate um, the workers' compensation jurisdictions around the country, ComCare included, for the work you've done to elevate this important topic. But we've got a ways to go. So the national results is we're sitting at 62.7 out of 100. Not bad, but a long way to go. For the public administration and safety, which is in the purple, um, we're at 58.9 out of 100. And it just goes to show that I think over here, when we're looking at policy, you know, we're doing it really well um, compared to the national average. But it's the other areas, the other domains that I think needs probably a little bit more focus and opportunity for focus. We see when we look at large organisations, they do uh, policy particularly well and small organisations do connectedness really well. So what do we learn from both of those and how do we apply it across the board? So where are we sitting when we're looking at all of the industries across Australia? These are the 2018 results by industry. The very best industries in the country are electricity, gas, water and waste services. Professional, scientific and technical services and arts and recreation. Now, I so get the arts and recreation. I really get that. <laughs> but I'm thinking, what are they doing in, you know, water, gas, all of those types of services that we could be learning from and doing a little bit differently? Unfortunately, folks, at the bottom is the public administration and safety. And I know for some of you that won't be a surprise as you're aware of some of the results. But we do have a ways to go. And I think what I would love to encourage you today is think about how is it that you can be the catalyst for change to actually make a difference? As Karen was talking about, how do you fulfil and, and see that ripple on the pond effect in the work that you can be doing as champions, as leaders in your business, really driving the necessary dialogue to shift these numbers? And they've been broken up to marry uh, against those five different domains, the first of which is leadership. In the indicator, uh, sorry, in the building thrive, Thriving Workplaces uh, Guideline book, you'll see that there is a little grey call-out boxes of action areas. Now, this is really to help employers, people leaders, human resource people and culture, whoever it might be, to actually have some prompters, some, some ideas starters. They are definitely designed to be fairly simple for them, for people to, to um, address. When I think about leadership, to me, it comes down to what's the conversations we're having? What's the dialogue? What language are we using? How well do we know our people? Like really well do we know our people? And therefore, what are the conversations that we're having from the very first time we interact with that person, potentially in an interview situation, onboarding them and through the employee life cycle? A dear friend of Superfriend is Marianne Bainton from Canada. Um, she's been instrumental in driving a lot of the um, mentally healthy workplace initiatives across Canada. And we, uh, we had her here in Australia a couple of years ago and she gave us these three questions. And um, honestly, they're probably one of the best gifts I think I've ever received in my life. Um, what these questions are is, as a people leader, is to be able to have an appropriate conversation to get to know your staff members. We encourage you to think about doing this from the get-go. Super friend, this is something that we do as part of the onboarding and induction process is to ask these questions. But there is a caveat, there's a bit of a warning. It's like a three-legged stool. If you only ask two, you'll fall off. So you need to ask all three. The first is, what do you need from me as your people leader to come to work and do the job that you've been employed to do that you are so excited to do because you're a new starter? What is it that you need from me to do that job and yet go home at the end of the day with enough energy left over to read to the kids or to take the dog for a walk or to go and play a game of indoor hockey or, or whatever it might be that you want to do? What is it that you need from me and have that conversation? Most people know themselves and how they like to be managed and led uh, pretty well. And if you start with that, it's a great opening trust-based question. The second is about you as the employee. And this is where I think sometimes we fall over a little bit expecting workplace mental health is the responsibility of the CEO and the leadership team. Got nothing to do with me. Well, this is an opportunity to actually balance that out. 
because if I turn up for work and I am haven't slept, I'm rude, I'm you know demonstrating all of the things we've heard about this morning about incivility, then I'm not participating in my contract of going to work in a thriving and mentally healthy workplace. So the second one is about what are you going to do to look after you and promote your own mental health? And if you don't know how to strengthen your own mental health, well, there's a very, very good question and a good discussion to have. When I, if I was to run around this room or any of the people on the video and ask you, how do you strengthen your mental health? We'll get a myriad of different answers. For me, it's natural light, it's nature, it's coffee in the morning. You know, there's a range of different things that I need that's really good for my mental health. But the number one thing is sleep. So what is it you're going to do to promote your own or, or strengthen your own mental health is the second question. And then the third one, and obviously you take notes and you, you listen and you probe and you seek further out answers. The third one is around how would you like me to communicate with you if I notice that things aren't going so great? And then what? And then what? And you're writing it all down. And then what? So you continue to dig and dig and dig and dig. This is so important that you say, you know, and you find out how they want you to approach them. Some people want an email. Some people want face-to-face -face conversation behind closed doors. Some people want you to say, I need to have a conversation with you. Let's set up a time so they have time to reflect and be prepared for that conversation. Different people need different things. So have an understanding about what your people actually need. They are great questions and I encourage you to trial them out. I'd love to hear how they go. Practical ideas. If anyone is not familiar with the VIA or VIA character strengths, free website, Martin Seligman's been involved. It's absolutely fantastic. There's 24 character strengths. You can't go wrong. They're all strengths. They're all great. We know humans, when they're able to use their strengths and their talents, they bring their better selves to work. If we understood what those strengths and talents were, we'd get actually much better engagement and the opportunity to to have great conversations. We've also heard about the positivity ratios today. These positivity ratios of Barbara Fredrickson of three to one is within a normal workplace environment. You throw in organisational restructure, any major change, huge deadlines or work pressures, you throw in anything like that over the top, three to one is not going to cut it. Those numbers need to go up substantially and we saw that in uh, Joe's presentation earlier. Aligning purpose and meaning. We talk at Superfriend a lot about having a shared vision um, and really bringing that shared vision together through a co-design and co-creation. So how do we create together what the shared vision of a particular project that we'll be working on? How do we work together for a shared vision with our partners? And you work at that and create that together. You get buy-in, you get um, engagement, and you end up with, <laughs> I think, a much better outcome. Dealing with change is a standard these days. I think, you know, change is, is the new normal. Uh, we've got to recognise that as organisations, we're going to be leading our people through change constantly. Big changes or small changes, but it will be constant. So how do we use some of the positivities of the sciences, of the strengths-based approaches and the co-design, co-creation methodologies to really lead those systems of change? And that's about talking to people as transparently as you possibly can and helping them really understand about how to how to change together. And from our friend Marianne Bainton and the work that she's done um, in Canada, um, she's again generously given Superfriend the opportunity to uh, promote this uh, resource, which is on a collaboration website, which I've left on the slides here, which you'll be given. So this is another practical tool. Um, it's also a, a favourite of mine. And the um, opportunities in here for people leaders to be able to uh, utilise um, this uh, range of activities uh, to help foster and, and develop those, those conversations. So when you don't know how to start the conversation, there's some practical guidance there. But the one I love the most is mistake meetings. It needs to be led by the leader. Um, but it's about vulnerability and talking about, hey, I'm not perfect. I've made massive mistakes. Let's talk about them and, and unpack them um, and share those together. In the connectedness area, this is really about how we can bring people together. Sense of community, sense of belonging. It's the best protector for our mental health. So we really need to have that strong sense of belonging and connectedness. 
There are many different ways that we can do that from how we start our meetings, do we engage in people? We had a conversation in the break about, you know, video con and, and sometimes, you know, when you're on a VC um, or a telecon, you're straight into the meeting and the agenda and you don't necessarily stop and say, hey guys, how are you going? How's your weekend? What's, it, what's everyone up to? So I think it's those new normals that we need to create um, when technology is an enabler. How do we actually go about creating that? Bringing workers from different teams together. I mean, it sounds simple and it really is, but we need as leaders to be able to facilitate more of this uh, so that we get greater diversity and inclusion, we get greater co-design and that sense of belonging and connectedness. I was talking to a CEO colleague yesterday and they have recently moved their, their organisation and rather than moving an intact team and the team sitting together, they've mixed everybody up off the floor, over the floor. So it has created this sense of connectedness that's quite different to when, you, when you're when you sitting in an intact, intact team. Now that's not going to work for everybody, but it's a, certainly a thought, uh, thought starter. Some practical ideas is finding those positive energizers in your organisation. We all know them, they're the sort of people you want to hang out with, they've got great energy, they typically love what they do, they will typ typically have answered strongly agree because you know that's their sort of person to the indicators of a thriving workplace. And putting those in people into key projects to attract others and foster cultural changes that way. Engaging discussions around community. And I think we've got to look at community as a much broader lens than what we currently look at community inside a workplace. We had a conversation starter inside Superfriend a little while ago about community and um, the opportunities of how, what do I define community compared to others? So it's uh, great, easy ways to do that. Policy in action, and I've underscored the in action part of it because I think it's really important that we don't just have them written down on a piece of paper, but we actually see them. One of the great examples I've, I've ever seen of this or heard of this is PwC has a great program called uh, Green Light to Talk. And essentially it's partners uh, across the PwC um, network sharing their own lived experience of mental health conditions that they've had. More importantly, they also talk about how did PwC support them. Now that to me is policy in action. That's about stay at work action, that's about return to work action and how do we tell those stories and help people connect to those policies in action. I think the other um, opportunity here and back to the integrated approach is rather than have a mental health policy that sits out here on its own, how do you take your entire policy suite with the glasses of mental health and wellbeing of your people and review all of your policies. So your travel policy, are you expecting people to get back to work after travelling all day the day before and flying in at you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night and, and to be at an eight o'clock meeting the following morning? What are the, what are the expectations and the, and the normals going on in your organisation and how do you have an integrated approach to your mental health and wellbeing policies? I'm a firm believer of co-design and co-creation. I think if you don't have the right people around the table and that being a cross-section, you're not going to get the very best results that you need for your business. So looking at how you refresh your policies with your, with your staff will be a really incredible thing. And as I said, sharing those positive stories is really important. In the capability area, this is about how do you build the skills and the confidence of people to be able to have the appropriate conversations at work. So this is building leadership capability. If you're a small organisation or your resources are limited, this is your best bang for buck. If your people leaders don't know how to lean in, recognise the early warning signs of deteriorating mental health and be able to help somebody, then um, you know it's really going to be a very dire situation. So I'd really encourage you to think about the type of training you need and the training provider. There is a lot of providers out there you know, many are doing great work, but it may not be the right fit for what you actually need. So again, a co-design uh, process can be really helpful. Leading with compassion and building coaching capability. Really mindful that we've got some skill bases here that will, will really help people to be ha able to have the conversations that we've heard, you know, Joe talk about peer to peer. Very, very important in the capability set. And culture, which is the last one. So what we've um, determined here is that alignment to the team objectives or the organisational strategic objectives and what does my role 
feel and fit to those objectives? How do we have conversations before we even get going on a particular project? Where does this project fit into our strategic organisational objectives? Where does this team fit in delivering to that? Where does my role in that team fit? And really helping people join the dots. Sometimes we think, oh, it's pretty obvious, but it may not be. And having a conversation can really, and a dialogue about it can be really important. Likewise, on the values and behaviours, this is about seeing, you know, behaviours are your values in action. What you walk past is what you, you say is okay. And we've heard that this morning, that that's actually not okay. So thinking about what are the values of your organisation and how do you convert that into what's great behaviours you want to see and reward, as well as what are the behaviours you actually need to call on and call up. Co-create, co-design, sorry for the theme running through, but I love it. I think it is the game changer for business. I think it is the way that we create thriving workplaces. And effectively supporting people through change and role modelling and rewarding people as we go. So if we're going to be running any change processes, which are happening all the time, and creating and building a thriving workplace, what are the steps? Now, none of this is will be new to you, I absolutely know, but it's a reinforcement of the fact we need to have leadership buy-in. We know it's a single success factor associated with, um, with engaged workplaces and building thriving workplaces. So your leaders need to walk the talk. They need to be on board. How you get them on board is going to be different for every organisation, but it is critical. Diagnose and determine the priorities for change. You can't do it all. Think about what is what have you already got? Where are you at in a maturity scale of what you've already got? And that's really, really helpful because it helps to prioritise where those next, where those gaps are and where those opportunities are. There's also a, a um, organisation we've done a little bit of work with as well who spent a year promoting, just communicating what they already had in place. They did nothing new, nothing new, but they took what they had in place and they promoted it. And what they saw was their workers' comp premium come down over time. What they saw was increased engagement, reduction in presenteeism, absenteeism and the like. So you don't necessarily need to um, spend an enormous amount of money. Agree the scope and implement positive workplace practices. Again, have a conversation. What are positive practices in our workplace? What does that look like and feel like? Co-create initiatives to build thriving workplaces and then measure, report, review is a really important process so that you can continue to plan that continuous improvement cycle. It's in, in, invaluable for workplaces to be able to measure what you're currently doing. Um, it's no surprise that workplace mental health is a really hard thing to measure. We're trying to measure something that perhaps didn't happen. In some cases, we're trying to measure things like well, how did I feel yesterday to how do I feel tomorrow or in a month's time or as a result of a particular intervention or program? So having a think about what's your evaluation framework from the beginning and the design of the intervention is a really smart way to do it. We do have about 10 minutes or so for questions, so fantastic opportunity uh, for any questions for Margot. Any uh, questions first here in Canberra, colleagues in front of me at the moment? Not so much, all quiet. Gretchen? Adelaide. 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 Over to you, Adelaide. Yeah, thank you. It's Tom in Adelaide. Question from a colleague, actually, who just had to leave. Uh, I was in relation to the comment you made about Canada and Australia being best globally for mentally healthy workplaces and where that um, statement comes from. So, great question. Thanks, Tom. So, it really comes from uh, when we're in an international setting and looking at what different countries around the world are doing. Um, I think the reason that Australia and Canada are, are so close to the top, and you know, the UK is doing great work, there are other pockets of great work that are happening, uh, but the reason that Canada and Australia is, is ahead is because we typically take a whole of nation approach and we've got some foundational um, elements to the way that we work, such as our work health and and safety legislation here in this country. Um, I think in Canada, they um, a number of years ago released the psychological safety standards, uh, 
colloquially referred to as the <coughs> standards. That's the first time ever a country has had um, a national approach, bless you, national approach of um, you know psychological safety from a voluntary perspective, uh, particularly focused on mental health and wellbeing. So there are certainly great examples happening around the world, uh, but I do think um, when you're sort of sitting alongside even some of the Scandinavian countries where you think, yep, they should be doing it great, um, because of cultural cultural reasons or other reasons, uh, we typically are able to uh, demonstrate we're doing things a little bit better and they're learning from us, which is great. Thank you. Uh, over to Melbourne, we've got a question in Melbourne. Hello, hometown. <laughs> Hello. Melbourne, Hi, question. Oh, just wrong button. Oh, uh, have we lost <laughs> Melbourne, have we? <laughs> oh, Melbourne are. is back. <laughs> Melbourne, over to you. <laughs> Hi there, sorry about that. That was uh, not pressing the mute button. You um, <laughs> talked about the importance of positivity and how in times of stress or change that you needed to up that ratio. Is it one of those things where we're looking at tailoring to our different um, individuals in our workplace that if we know someone's going through particular challenges that we actually have to be conscious of upping that positivity ratio to individuals at different times? Look, absolutely, I think that's a really great point, is that when we step back, you know, an organisation is made up of individuals and we're not all going to be on the same, you know, point in our own mental health, uh, which is different to illness, but we're not going to be on that same uh, trajectory at any one time. So there will be people who will be experiencing, you know, either outside of work or inside of work some challenges and recognising that if you can take a more positive and supportive approach um, and spend time in understanding what you could be doing in addition to what normally you're doing to support them, the better it's going to be. And likewise with a team. There are some teams at various times in a business cycle that will be you know, under the, under the <coughs> slammer for getting things done, hitting those deadlines, getting things out the door. You know, you take a major conference inside Comcare and the events team, I'm sure, Gretchen, you, you know, your team gets, you know, gets that pressure as, as the event gets closer. So how do we take a more positive approach um, in recognising where those organisations, as individuals, as well as teams, as well as the whole organisation is? Any questions here in Canberra? I'll just do a check. Yep, there's a question just coming now. Um, so this question feels maybe a bit risky or a bit scary. Okay. Um, and it's sort of to all of the presenters. Because I think as I was listening and looking at the stats and the data, I was reflecting on some of the challenges that we have in public administration, which is that we sometimes appear to be a bit of a scapegoat for some of the social problems that we have because we're intersecting with those problems. And it appears that the media is quite fond of letting the public service know that it's you know, not, uh, not doing such a great job. And sometimes our political masters at both levels and across the various sides of the House um, may not act in the most civil manner towards the public sector. If you talk to the person in the pub on the street, the Clapham bus, um, they don't always have the most positive view of the public sector. So there's a degree, I think, of incivility that often happens towards public administration. So I'm just sort of wondering, as I was listening to the speakers about um, that leap of faith uh, to a degree or trust that leaders need to have to kind of step in and embrace um, some of these things and acting towards civility, is there any sort of advice or thoughts on how to be defensible in doing some of these things, to, to have something that's robust that you can stand up and when you come under that scrutiny to still stand up and say, this has value, this is important, etc. I would share with you that um, as an organisation, a workplace mental health organisation that's funded by life insurers, which are not the most favoured organisations either on the planet, um, and working with the superannuation industry, which is um, an industry that doesn't have uh, huge engagement until you probably hit about the age of 45 to 50 and you go, oh, hang on, retirement's just there, what's my balance? Um, a lot of what you have said resonates into other industries as well. We've just come off the back of a Royal Commission um, into the banking and, and financial services industry, which was not great um, at all. And I think what it is to me is that we've got to start with our own backyard and we've got to start with building trust in our own workforce to know that the job that they are doing, the contribution that they are making is making the right sort of difference. And 
I think when you're able to um, harness that as a, as a team in the first instance and then as a broader organisation and stand up and be proud um, of the work that you're doing, um, it does make leaning into those situations with the media or you know, public scrutiny um, a lot harder. Um, the group life insurers is an example um, in the insurance space. So that why they're called group is that they uh, insure the group of members that are within a superannuation fund. You know, they're paying claims um, above 92% every year. We never hear that on the front page um, of, um, you know, of the newspaper or, or the 7.30 report or wherever it might be. Yet they're doing great work and they're getting people back to work. They're getting people back to wellness and functioning and life as, you know, as are our fabulous health insurers around the country. So we typically, um, as humans, like to focus in on the negative and that's why negativity sells versus focusing in on the positive. However, in inside your own organisation, you think about the positive stories that you hear. Um, you know, Karen shared with us beautifully her own, you know, parts of her own personal story and her own journey and, and the positive effect. I don't know about you, but I sat there with goosebumps. You can't help not get engaged and feel that stuff. So starting within your own organisation, your own team, starting those dialogues and sharing those, I think is a really, really great way to build a bit of a resilient, you know, uh, force field around you so that when the mud does get flicked your way, it doesn't actually stick. Mm, great question. Yeah. Uh, any any states at the moment? Anyone else from here in Canberra at the moment? Just while people are thinking, um, Margot, I was going to ask you, what's the best bang for your buck? Yeah. And you actually answered it while you Definitely. were while you were talking, which was leadership. You said leadership. If you're going to invest anywhere in all of those dimensions that you talked about, invest in leadership and leadership's ability to talk about this, to be aware of it, to understand it. And then you said, uh, you made a comment which I thought was really insightful, which is leaders need to get on board, but how you get them on board will differ in different organisations. And I think a lot of us will work, we, some of us might work in organisations where leaders are absolutely on board, get it, want to contribute. Others of us will probably work or have worked in places where that's not the case. Do you have any thoughts about that? Absolutely. So I'll just qualify leaders. I talk about leaders as all people leaders. So this isn't just leaders as the top of the organisation. This is leaders, Jill, throughout the entire organisation. They're going yep. to be the first people to pick up those early warning signs. When they eyeball you every day, either via Skype or, or in person, they'll pick up the early warning signs. I think by getting leaders on board, there are, um, you need to understand the strengths of your own leader and you need to understand how do they like to receive information. There are people who are visual, there are people who like to see the numbers and the statistics and will absolutely see when you put in front of them a business plan uh, or a business case for this, that, that you know, those numbers stack up. So I think it's about thinking about who your leader is, how have you got something tricky and difficult across the line previously with them? How do you need to present that? And what is the rallying of the troops and the building of your positive energizers across the organization that you can be demonstrating to those leaders that this is a movement that they need to be getting on board mm. with? I do also believe that organizations who do not address creating mentally healthy workplaces will not be here in the next decade. Mm. This is the next wave, it's coming, people are talking about it, they know it's making a difference. I know within the ComCare stats, as in within the life insurance stats, you know, mental illness claims are the ones that are going up. They're the hardest to, to, to manage, you know, they're typically uh, the most costly to manage. We've got some really great indicators as to why an employer needs to get on board and, um, and yeah, mm -hmm. invest in their own people and their people leaders and their own culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other opportunity is to look for the influences, if it's at a CEO level, level or a senior leader, the influences outside their organisation. So the indicators of a thriving workplace, uh, 40 indicators, we're turning that into a tool. And the reason we're turning that into a tool is that, yes, it's going to be fascinating for an organisation to you know, run this out as a, not an engagement survey because it's not that, but as a survey across their, their own organisation. 
But the kicker will be when they can compare themselves competitively with other similar organisations in their industry. And that's where we see is a, is a great lever for those mm. perhaps laggards um, who might try, you know, take a little bit too long to get on board this bus that's already taken off. Mm, that's terrific. Thanks a lot, Margot. Margot, we're out of time, unfortunately, for questions. Really appreciate the insights you've given us. Could you join with me in thanking Margot? <laughs>